Welcome to Hunt the Land podcast, centered on bow hunting, habitat management, and all things deer. Now here are your hosts, Mark Turner and Mariah Bogus. Hey guys, I'm Mark. And I'm Mariah, and this is episode 16 of Hunt the Land podcast. Today, Mariah and I are going to be talking about graduate school. What exactly it is, what we study, and how you can apply if you're interested in taking a wildlife grad job. Welcome everybody to episode 16 of the podcast. Today, we're going to be talking uh, about something a little bit different than just hunting strategy. I know we have some hunting stories we want to cover here in the future, kind of some recent happenings in the woods or lack thereof um, from the sound of of what I'm hearing from Mark and kind of from me, but uh, talk a little bit of strategy. But then our topic for today is going to be wildlife graduate school, which I think is um, really relevant since we're both graduate students and um, maybe some of you, you know, aren't clear on what graduate school is. I know I really haven't understood it well, um, until getting, you know, into the program and figuring out what's going on. So I think today what we should focus on is what is wildlife graduate school, kind of what our projects are, what kind of work we're doing as graduate students. And then I also want to cover, um, how others, uh, especially people in undergraduate uh, programs right now, if they're interested in graduate school, what they should be thinking about, what they should know about graduate school, going into it and planning for it. So that's kind of the idea I've got. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, I'm definitely down for that, especially given the uh, lack of excitement on the hunting end so far from both of us. Yeah. Uh, well, at least from, from me, but from yeah. the, just from the sound of it for the past week, it's been pretty slow on both, both fronts. Well, about so. that. It seems like everyone in the Midwest is killing deer because it's getting close to the rut and it's cool. Yeah, I know. It's it's hard to like, well, obviously I don't feel sorry for him at all. Like I'm jealous, but it's hard to believe that, you know, just up above us, like the deer are starting to pre-rut a little bit. Um, Things are getting exciting. People are killing big deer and here it's been pretty warm. I mean, it has gotten better over the last week, couple of weeks, but the deer aren't doing much, you know? Yeah, and I kind of, I've always kind of wondered, like, what, it just doesn't, you know, I kind of wonder, like, what the fall transition's like for for deer here versus in uh, in other areas, just because you don't have that rut happening, and I feel like it's probably an additional stressor, like, having to wait to breed until, in some cases, January and February, I feel like that's an, that's got to be an additional stressor, because the deer are not... I mean, they they can't be in that great a condition going into that time period. I mean, it's not, it's certainly not as cold as it is in some parts of the Midwest and stuff like that, or pretty much anywhere else in the country, really. But I, I just have to think that deer are in pretty poor condition whenever they are in the rut down here. Yeah. So, well, it, I don't know how, but obviously it's not enough of a, um, what we would call a selective pressure to really change breeding dates at least not thus far so that we've observed so well from a hunting standpoint i think it's interesting and something that i'm really curious to see play out this fall and i'm sure i'll learn more in the future but you know like you and i both coming from north carolina we have a pretty traditional rut i mean for me it's thanksgiving Mm -hmm. week it's a little later than what you always hear about you know the early november rut of the midwest but yours is pretty early november i want to say it's peaks around the eighth or the ninth where you're at that's right yeah and yeah so it's like for us the deer come out of velvet in september they've got about a month month and a half and then things start to heat up you know late october early november and that's what i'm used to so like you're saying it, it just feels so weird and foreign to know that the bucks have been out of velvet for a month now and it's going to be at least another month and a half before there's any kind of pre-rut activity here as far as like bucks looking obviously i've i've been seeing rubs and this week i found some scrapes but yeah it's a whole new deal to me so i'm i'm really curious to see how it plays out in the future exactly but yeah so um i guess with that 
obviously we kind of alluded to it, but I don't think I've talked to you about deer hunting here recently. Uh, what, what's been going on on that end of things in Mississippi? I, I know you said it's been pretty slow, but anything yeah. exciting at all? Well, you know, and it's been slow because I've just been in the wrong spots, probably. I know when I've been out doing field work, I've been seeing deer everywhere, which just kind of is salt in the wound. But I think since we, we spoke last, I've been twice. And I went one evening. It was a super rainy evening. I ended up sitting on um, this little oak ridge that right off the edge of a of an oxbow. Well, I guess it's more of a cypress, um, cypress break. But uh, I set up there, kind of came in, you know, I walked through the property, kind of scouting my way in, set up there, wasn't seeing a lot of mass dropping, you know, no acorns really. I sat there for an hour and the rain was supposed to let up, but it was just pouring rain. I was like a mile and a half back and I started to get really cold, just freezing. And I started thinking, you know, this is crazy. This is a, a fuel fool's errand. I wasn't seeing the sign I was hoping. So I thought, is that when you, you know, texted me about uh, rain gear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, like, that was my the recommendations day. Like, on rain gear. <laughs> I was like, Mark, what kind of rain gear do you have, and uh, how important do you think it is? <laughs> I, I I ordered rain gear that night. By the way, I've got a set oh, coming. Good. Yeah, you were like, "Is it worth it?" And I was like, "Well, if you don't want to get wet." <laughs> Like, thanks. Like, <laughs> thanks for that I mean, wisdom. <laughs> I mean, I definitely, yeah, I think having good rain gear is important, especially if you're going to be out much. Um, well, I've got a blue rain jacket, and I was wearing that over my camo because um, I was just like trying to stay as dry as possible. Um, right. Yeah, but it, I think if I'd had rain gear, I might have hunted a little differently, but I kind of talked myself out of getting out of the stand. I did what I hate doing. I got down early. I got in the stand at 4.30, and I climbed down at 5.30 because it was still pouring rain, and I, I didn't think the deer would move, and I thought I had a better chance of actually learning something about you know that property. There were portions there that looked really good I had never walked before. And my mentality was, hey, you know, it's raining. Deer aren't going to see me walking through as easily. I'll slip through slowly. I might you know see one slip up on it, and if nothing else, I can scout, and most of my scent will get washed away, hopefully. You know, I'm not going to have a huge impact. Um, so I got down at a stand, did that for about 45 minutes, uh, ended up finding some huge rubs, some really good sign, and it has kind of led me to what my play will be tonight. But then the rain let up about 30 minutes before dark. I ended up jumping a deer right as I was circling back through right underneath where my stand had been set up. So, yeah, (laughs) it it was an idiot move. I probably should have never got down. Uh, But I'll take that all back if the knowledge that I, you know, kind of learned just from walking around leads to a deer in the next day or two. Because that's I'm going back into that spot Um, tonight. uh, As soon as we get off here. It's been raining, and uh, the rain just let up. It's cool. It's a high of like 67 today. We've got a northwest wind, and I'm going to be sitting on the edge of this marsh where I know there's deer bedded all out there. Um, that rainy day I was up there, I could see rub, fresh rubs like that day or the day before all along that marsh. Just outside the marsh, I found an overcup oak with fr- three fresh scrapes under it. And uh, so lots of fresh deer sign. I also found one rub that was about it was on a cypress tree about six inches in diameter and it was just shredded so i know there's a i know there's good deer in the area i've seen good deer there scouting in summer so i'm really excited to get in there so i'm going to set up like if you look at the marsh uh it has a hard edge on the right where there's a levee and the deer are transitioning from the from west to east out of that marsh onto private land and i'm going to basically set up in the southeast corner of where i think deer Basically, the far southeast corner of where I think deer may enter, exit that marsh with my wind coming from the northwest. So I'm I'm just going to kind of play it safe this evening and not booger anything up because I have tomorrow evening to hunt. So I'm really hoping I'll see something tonight and then make a move on it tomorrow because we have a northeast wind tomorrow. So it's going to be pretty close to the same. And that's my game plan. Um, I hunted yesterday morning. Not a lot to talk about there. hunted some bedding and uh ended up getting in there really well it looked good but it was all really there was a ton of sign but it was about a week old so i think i was just kind of a a week late and a dollar short there so Mm. that's the that's the updates here um i'm really excited about tonight i i can't wait yeah man i 
I thought about. I really wish I could. I could get out. I just. Uh, I'm kind of debating things. I've got a friend in town, and so there's that. And then um, NC State plays Clemson here in a little oh, bit, and so I really want to watch that. I know. I you know. Can't let but a football game okay, keep you out of but, the woods. But here's the here's Come the other on. thing. Here's the other thing with that. I still can't shoot does in the the areas that I hunt. And I have a yeah. hard time convincing myself. Well, I don't have a hard time convincing myself to go to the woods. I shouldn't say that because that's definitely not true. But I guess I have an easier time justifying not going and just kind of waiting until I think it's a week from now that I can shoot does. Just because like that, man, that sucks this time of year to not be able to go out and shoot a doe if I want to. Um and yeah. mm-hmm. and thus far my hunts haven't been very good, so I'm not gonna say I'm like super down about that. I didn't really expect a lot, but um, my first evening sit was an ordeal to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I I get in, I get down there on the opener, and I see some guys out burning, and. I was like, okay, like the, the WMA staff. And so I yeah, drove up yeah. and talked to them and they were burning off all their food plots because it was a, the weather was right for it. And they're just, they'd sprayed them and they were burning off all the food plots to get ready to plant. Well, um, <laughs> at that point I'm sitting there like, well, where, where are y'all headed to next? And they were literally about to go burn right where I was trying to go hunt. And I was going to hunt off this buck bed that I found that, I had the right wind for. So were they going to burn a forest stand or are they burning like old fields or they something? They were burning, they were burning food plots and old okay. fields, but mostly food plot. I mean, you know, just the areas around the food plot. And so I wasn't going to be right on the food plot, but at the same time I was a little ways away. Um, Like I, I would have been down there where they were burning and everything else. I mean, it wouldn't have been the end of the world and maybe I should have just gone there still. But I felt like it was going to be a little close. And it probably wasn't. I probably should have just gone there. But, you know, I just didn't want to get in the way of what they were doing and stuff. So I said, well, I'll just I'll just go to, go to another spot. Because I've got plenty of areas to hunt. So I ended up going. So that was like the first problem. So I ended up going to the spot that I killed my buck last year. And got in and set up on trying to think of anything else happened no it didn't not before this so i got in and set up in this little black gum so i was trying to get another species you know and let me tell (laughs) you uh i'll have a blog coming up next week but um i'm really glad i went ahead and got the lone wolf stand it's a it's a good stand they're just it's well built it hangs so easy i think just uh, a second let's clarify for anyone who hasn't listened like our first episode or whatever you and i have a uh a challenge, right? Oh yes, yeah. So our challenge is how who can kill the most, who can kill deer out of the most different tree species. So every, you know, every different oak species or pine tree species, we we each have a basically a running tally of who can kill the most. I don't know when it ends. I think it's just a, it's more of a bragging right when you get a new species. It's really tough. Like uh, yeah, like when you like not that seven. common. Yeah, like the other day I I got that persimmon. And the other, you know, uh just the other yesterday morning I was in a cypress. That's one Ooh. I really want to get. Yeah, I have a stand actually. Or I have a, one spot that I could kill a deer out of a cypress and I've thought about hunting it just for the challenge. But <laughs> T- tonight <laughs> will be a black willow just to put things in perspective. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. So uh anyway, um So got in there and got set up, and man, it was hot. I mean, it was 87, but it was just so humid. I mean, it was it's one of those days where the heat just kind of sucks all the energy out of you. And the wind was kind of variable in the spot that I was at, and so I didn't really have a lot of confidence after, you know, seeing how bad the wind, well, not bad the wind was. Like, when it would gust, it was doing the right thing, but sometimes it would just suck a different direction. So that kind of, that, that was kind of frustrating to deal with. But what was more frustrating was whenever I pulled my thermocell out and realized that I didn't have a new fuel canister for it. And I just <laughs> got like torn up by mosquitoes. I mean, it was, t- I had my, I put my, um, my hands inside my shirt 
you know, like to cover yeah. them. And I put, I have that, uh, that ghillie suit. Uh, it's not really a ghillie suit, but it's like the leafy suit that I wear just, you know, so I can wear shorts or whatever underneath. And I, it has a hood and I put the hood up and like, was just sitting there kind of like breathing hard to keep them off my face, you know, like blowing every once in a while that they try to buzz in my face. So that was pretty tough. But what, what really made it rough was whenever I was walking out, there's this log that I cross and I drug my buck across last year. There you are but bragging again. We, <laughs> we got a fair, Oh my just, gosh. Just slip, just <laughs> slipping it in there. Just, just real quick. <laughs> well, I just, I just should note that it supports I'm, I'm weight. Like I walk across, time. I know it walks across, <laughs> I walk across it every time. And, uh, so we got it. I, I was, and I walked in on it. So I'm walking out and you know, we got a bunch of, fair amount of rain from the hurricane and so the water was up and as i was walking out it decided it was going to break and i my leg fell down into it, it, there's like two logs that are parallel and so the one side didn't the one log didn't break but the other one did break and so my leg got drenched like down to my knee and it, and i'm wearing those snake boots that are not waterproof even though they say they're waterproof so it it was just a lot <laughs> so i got soaking wet and i didn't see any deer and then the wow. next time after that i set up and i went down there with um and hunted with a buddy and he set up in one of my study stands actually which we're gonna be talking i guess a little bit about what what i do that on regards Clar- to that in a little bit but clarify anyway real quick, study stand the, mark okay so it's like where i'm doing research so we've it's, gone it's in not and, it's not a study tree stand is, is what i'm saying no no oh yes yeah, sorry yes it's it's a block of block of timber that we've been doing research in and he actually had a bunch of does and fawns like right right next to him the whole night but um I didn't end up seeing anything. I got blown at a bunch because the thermals were way different than what I thought they would be. And I just kind of predicted it wrong. But so that was tough. But then my last hunt, and this, this is the interesting one that, I, um, the best hunt that I've had so far is my last one, which I guess was a couple of days ago. I got out the other evening and hunted that oxbow stand. That's an oxbow lake on the property that's near here, near Auburn. Got out and hunted there and didn't see any deer there's a lot of deer sign though and had a good strong wind it was when that first little front was coming through this week the uh, i mean there's a bigger one coming through now but it was that first little front that was coming through so had like a northeast wind got out there was set up and there's a bunch of persimmons out there but they'd all dropped and so i don't really know how much attraction there was with that and that's why that's why, you know, that's part of the reason why I'm not super big on persimmons just because it's down here they're done by the time the season comes in. I mean, you get about you get a couple weeks, but it's uh where you're located, but we typically don't. Like typically they're for the most part they're on the ground. You you have to find like a late holding tree or something like that to be able to hunt persimmons, but Anyway, I was sitting out there and I heard something walking in and it was actually a coyote, which I thought was funny because of your whole situation that you shot that coyote hunting an oxbow lake as well um, on persimmons. And so it came out like 20 yards from me, just gorgeous coyote. And unfortunately I had a branch blocking me because I've never shot one with my bow and that would have been pretty cool, but that didn't happen. But it was at least something. (laughs) at least i saw something i did see i have seen one three-year-old though um i think i i was on the phone with you wasn't i when i saw that deer yep yeah it sounded like you about to wreck the truck when you all of a sudden started yelling deer on the phone in the middle of a conversation (laughs) yeah i was i was sharing my uh story of how terrible my first hunt was (laughs) and then all of a sudden i was like oh that's a buck that's a good buck (laughs) as a three-year-old and he just stood there i stopped the truck and he stood there on the side of the road it was on the wma um driving back for my first hunt so apparently there's there's one out there somewhere there's a deer so i haven't seen him from the stand (laughs) did you mark that spot or you 
do you think he'll like go back and try to figure out what's going on there or, or like hunt that area now that you know there's a good one there? So I have a buddy that's already hunting that area because he's seen that deer crossing the road there. So I'll huh. probably just stay away from there. Yeah. It sounds like there's but, a pattern there though. I mean, yeah, that, this is the second time. The only thing is the other time. It was in the evening, and he was going the opposite direction. So oh, nice. <laughs> you, don't really, you don't really know which way he's going, but apparently he's doing something similar. At least he he likes to cross the road there. That's what we know. So well, set up about unless, 20 yards off that. Unless the day that you saw him, he had already crossed the road the one way, and he was headed back. You know, that's something to think of right there. It's true. It was like an hour after dark, so maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> Could be. But regardless, maybe there's yeah. A- persimetry or something over there and he went over there nate and then you know he was headed back across the road or something to hard you know acorns or something like that yeah that's true i don't know i i don't know i might have to go in there and check it out but like i say my buddy's already hunting that area so i'm kind of not really trying to encroach on that but yeah that sums up my hunting so far Uh, unfortunately this weekend like i said i'm gonna be watching football and then uh, hanging out with my friend and then we leave for that conference tomorrow so i don't i won't have time to hunt tomorrow either way so i really could have only hunted once this weekend anyway so yeah it's well, kind of it's all right i'm just ready to shoot a doe but i don't know if i've told you this i do have big plans for next weekend really shooting a doe yep i do no, not next weekend. Well, maybe. I mean, I don't know. I might at this point I might shoot a doe, but I'm probably I'm like ninety percent sure I'm gonna go home and hunt the muzzleloader opener in North Carolina. It's gonna be interesting, but it's a good time of year to be in the woods up there, so fingers crossed. I, I think I think I'll have a good chance. I don't know that I'll shoot a doe just because it is gonna be the rut but we'll see. I, I, I'm hard to, it's hard for me to turn down shooting a doe. Mm, man, I'm so jealous right now because I really would love to go home. I just, unfortunately, a little bit too tied up in things here with my project and everything. Uh, so, okay, so that will be, what, October 27th? That'll be right before Halloween. Which is usually a pretty good time. Even at my house is pretty good. And, and like I said, you're usually a week earlier on things. So have you ever seen much mature buck action that particular weekend? So I can't recall ever seeing, seeing a lot of it like on past hunts and stuff. But I do know last year on trail camera, I had a little flurry of buck activity around the 24th through the 27th or so of October last year. And again, our, our peak breedings around November 8th, but I had this little flurry that was there and I, I don't know what it was. I mean, cause typically like our first, the first couple of days of November aren't super like, aren't super crazy. It usually heats up after that, but for whatever reason, last year I had a bunch of pictures then. So that's part of what's tempting me. Cause I mean, I think I had like, I want to say, I mean, there were several days that I could have hunted multiple stands and had an opportunity to buck that I was after. Yeah. Well, I hope you do this year. That's awesome. I'll be uh, holding down the fort down here in the deep south and figuring something out down here, I guess. Uh, My first chance will be, like I've talked about a thousand times, because I'm super stoked Thanksgiving week. I have about about seven days I think I'll be able to go home and hunt. So I'm really looking forward to that. But until then, I have a lot of work to do on my project, which is what we should be talking about now, probably. Uh, yep. Graduate school. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. so, Mariah, what exactly do you do? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> I get that all the time. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, well... Before we get into that, let's just talk about, like, what is graduate school? Um, Because, I mean, from the outside, or, I mean, really from any perspective, unless you're, unless you know someone personally who's in graduate school, it's just a really weird thing. It's like, you have a job, but you're in school. You don't have time, but you're really busy. 
but we're doing really cool things, at least in my opinion. So it's really... And you're not really taking that many classes. That's the one that I always get as people. Yeah. Uh, at least, you know, for both of us, people are always like, oh, well, how many classes are you taking? Oh, well, like one. <laughs> yeah, I have two. That blows people's minds. <laughs> yeah, I was in class one day this past week and it was a regular class. You know, I just ended up having to skip a couple because I was um, in the field collecting data. So yeah, let's let's talk about that. Um the general the general idea of graduate school, like what it is, what a what a project is and and like I'll let you start off and then I'll sprinkle in things as we go. Yeah, and so obviously the first thing to note is that we're talking about wildlife graduate school because that's what matters to us and I I think it, I don't know that it would be appropriate for us to talk about anything else cuz uh but for anybody that's that's either just because you're interested in what we do um, or if you're in the position of being a student um, interested in attending graduate school, really to break it down, like there's, there's two, and we're also going to be talking just about people getting their masters because that's the position we're in and we can't really talk on anything else past that. But the, I guess the thing I'm getting to is there's, there's a couple different routes that you can take. Um, one is a thesis and one is a non-thesis master's. And so both of us are getting our um, thesis-based master's, which basically means that we're doing research. And we're getting, for almost all of those, you do get a small salary and you, um, and the, uh, like your living arrangements and stuff like that are taking care, you know, or you just, just to be able to take care of some of that stuff. And your school's also paid for. And I don't know who your funding's through, Mariah, but mine is through the state. So basically, my professor had a research question, and he, and, and he talked to people at the state, and they were like, oh, yeah, that's something interesting. That would really be beneficial for us to know, to be able to manage our properties better, or whatever the case may be. I mean, that's, that's what was the case with mine. And so the state said, hey, we'll pay for you to do this research and um and a lot of that money actually comes from just as a note it comes from Pittman robertson dollars which are um it's basically an excise tax on hunting equipment and so thank you to all the hunters out there for yeah. <laughs> helping me get my education because i'm doing re i mean i'm doing research that will benefit hunters so that's that's the justification for it it's not just paying hey, for hey, random people to truth truth be told you and i have both contributed a lot to pittman robertson dollars oh. <laughs> and even money i'm getting now goes back, right back to it so oh absolutely and that's that's the thing i always kind of laugh about whenever i buy something hunting related i'm just like well i'm kind of paying my salary right now so whatever <laughs> yeah it's, like it's kind of like whenever uh um i was like when i was younger um, I guess part of me like thought it was kind of funny um, whenever we were in church or whatever and my dad was you know they were like tithing or whatever and I was like so basically you're paying your salary or you're helping pay your salary right now because he work he's he works as a uh, minister and he yeah. was like yeah I guess yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> that's but, great uh, <laughs> but any, so it's basically the same thing uh, <laughs> no but so yeah so you you apply for there's a bunch of these research projects out there that these professors have, and they're looking for students to complete the work. And so you work with your professor to do the research and there's, there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, both of our projects are focused on game species, AKA deer, but there's tons of other projects that are focused on anything from turtles to birds to you name it. There's a research project about it. And Basically, the deal is it's it's kind of a mutually beneficial deal. Obviously, we're getting an education and getting some experience in research, and the school and the state and your advisor are getting projects done that'll help them. You know, both for your advisor's case, get some publications, and from the position of the state, obviously they just they just want to know the information. And so both of us applied for positions and got them. And so we're now doing our, again, thesis masters. And it's typically a two to three year program. I think mine's going to be three. I think yours is two and a half, if I remember correctly. 
That's estimated the plan. <laughs> yeah plan so 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 it's a it's a pretty long master's degree compared to some other some other programs but again it's kind of nice cuz we're getting paid to do it and really what 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 depends or i guess what influences the length is simply how long it's going to take to collect the data so for some projects like I've got a buddy that's doing some some survey work. Like he's just asking different hunters what they think about things and looking at hunter use of WMAs and stuff like that. He's just sending out a survey. So he's going to be able to graduate in two years because that's all it's going to take for him to send out a survey and get the data back and analyze it. For me and for you, we're doing stuff out in the woods. And so it takes a little longer to do the treatments and then... um than to collect data and analyze it takes a little longer so that's why we're going to be here a little longer which kind of goes back to what i was talking about with not taking many classes i don't know what it's like at mississippi state but here at auburn we can only take i think it's 30 or 33 hours worth of class which typically during undergrad i was taking about as an average i was taking 15 or 16 hours worth of class each semester and so you really can't take many classes <laughs> And, uh, which you're, is, it, it's kind of nice. <laughs> you're saying that they limit your, your total time at grad school to what was it? 33 class yes, hours, 30, 33 class hours. Yep. And yeah. For, but for me, I have to have like, I don't, I don't think there's a, a cap on it, but the minimum is I have to graduate with 24. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. We have to graduate. We have, we only have to have, I think we have to have 30 or something like that. So, well, well, minus 30, but that includes six hours of research Okay, um, yep, hours, same. which are a whole nother deal. But actual class time, yeah, is, is 24 for me. Okay, yeah, that's the, that's the same case here. So, so yeah, we got the same deal, basically. But Yeah, and, and like yes. NC State was, 100 and, and, uh, it was 128, I believe, to graduate with the undergraduate degree that both you and I got. Yeah, so basically, long story short, you take, you take classes not necessarily to... That's not how you prove your worth in graduate school. You prove your worth by doing the research. The classes are basically just there to, and and typically the grading on graduate level classes is not. I'm not going to say it's not as difficult, but they're the professors are much more understanding and stuff like that because everybody's doing research, and so there's there's a little bit more leeway in some stuff because you're basically there to get the information you need to do your project for the class. You're not there to just learn it and get a good grade. Yeah. And I think probably about any advisor or anyone that's involved with grad school will tell you that right from the beginning, it's like your number one priority here is research to do good science, produce good research publications, um, work hard and get good grades. But that's for a reason stated last, like the other things are your top priority. Exactly. And that, I mean, again, at this point, I don't really think your GPA matters as much. I'm, and just because most people know that you're not taking difficult classes and you, you set your own classes. That's another important distinction. There's, there's a couple classes that we have to take here, but for the most part, we're not being told what classes we have to take. We just decide and say, okay, well, I'm going to take this class and this class and this class because it'll help me. Yeah, and, and those, like, and I know for at least for me, <clears throat> you need to run those by your advisor and your committee, and so mm -hmm. th that's that's kind of another aspect of graduate school is, like, both, so when you apply, like, you talked about your advisor had this research question, and he essentially hired you to answer the question as a research graduate uh, assistant, and, uh, or a graduate research assistant. I have that backwards. Um, so you have the stipend and all, and, and it's your responsibility to answer the question and however many years the, the funding goes through. Um, but then you get this education and all and, and living expenses. And then, so you have your, your major advisor, right? And that's the, the person that hired you. That's the same for me. I have my major advisor um, in the Deer Lab, Dr. Lashley. And then Beyond that, you have a committee, which will be, well, it, it varies by school, but it'll for me, it'll be Dr. Lashley plus two other um, research professors 
that I choose and that we, we all come to the understanding that their, their inputs, their expertise will be beneficial to um, my project and the questions I'm an asking. And then going forward, those, the research committee will influence what classes I take. They'll basically, okay, you know, classes or say, Hey, you should probably take, you know, this ecology class because your, your, you know, research question is an ecological one or something like that. So there's kind of this dynamic. It's like, you have your advisor and then you also have your committee that you answer to. And they're also, I mean, in, in both cases, your advisor and your committee, they're there for you. Um, cause obviously what we're doing is so dynamic, especially in the wildlife field. It's not like, Oh, we're just going to go out and thin these trees and everything's going to be perfect. Like obviously, or, or do this burn and everything's perfect. Obviously that constantly changes and nothing seems to work out. Right. So they're there to like, they're definitely there to help us. And, answer questions and eventually which is something i want to touch on like with with a thesis uh based graduate project we have to produce at the end our thesis which uh, if you're not familiar with that is basically um a couple of research papers uh, science-based research papers to be published in scientific journals for me i need to have two chapters to graduate and is that the same for you mark yep that's okay. The same deal. Yeah. So, like for me, I have I have one, and and at least for me, my main uh, thesis chapter is going to be looking at how the effects of deer herbivory, so deer basically browsing, and so their presence and seasonality of fire, timing of prescribed fire, summer versus dormant season fire, all affect oak regeneration. So, you know, basically oak reproduction. So that will be one chapter of my thesis, whatever the findings are from my research. And then another one, uh, another chapter is going to be something based with oaks and deer, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more, the project I'm working on now with that. But I guess my point is a thesis is it's all going to be geared toward um, a, a general overarching question. So mine is how deer and, you know, prescribed fire all affect oak regeneration so basically what are how our land management practices right now are affecting the future of oak forests which honestly look pretty uh bleak i don't think many people even realize what's happening uh all around them but oak forests are constantly disappearing and they're not being replaced um part of that comes from mismanagement part of it comes from our lack of understanding and how to properly regenerate forests you know back in the day it was just kind of I mean, there was some pretty bad stuff that happened in our country as far as forest management. I think we both would agree, but mm -hmm. you know, there was all this this uh, clear cutting on in the mountains, and it led to a lot of erosion. And there there was no thought of you know sustainable forestry management. But a lot of things that happened before that kind of just major disturbance and fire and and things that we don't have as much of any more led to you know the Appalachians being basically covered in oak hickory forests but a lot of that's is, is disappearing and it's disappearing across the country so that's kind of like that's that's where my research is geared toward but I'm also I guess what's another thing we can talk about is I, I also have side projects um and I know Mark you have a really cool one that I I don't know how much we can get into, but, I, you know, I want you to mention. But for me, one thing, you know, I'm working on is tick abundance. And so it's, it's completely separate from my thesis. You know, I'm here at, at Mississippi State. I'm doing research. I have a bunch of responsibilities to make sure get done on my thesis project so that, you know, at the end of two and a half years, I have a public I have publications that I can defend. But then also on the side, I'm doing um, this little research project with ticks and looking at tick abundance and uh, fire seasonality of fire. So that's something I've just kind of chose to do on the side and we'll present at conferences and write a publication on, um, hopefully if we find something really cool there. So that's kind of in addition. Um, I really don't get anything. It's not like I'm getting paid to do extra research, but um, it's really cool. It's useful information. And it'll be another publication for me and my advisor. Um, Mark, I know you've you've got something going on like that, right? Yep. So I, I guess first off, I'll talk about just my, my main research question. Um, mine is 
both of my chapters and my thesis are based on uh, this one question, which is basically how we manage our hardwood forests. So pretty similar to what Mariah is doing. The biggest difference is that I'm not just looking at fire and that I'm working in the coastal plain. So um, compared to Europe, Europe and kind of northern Mississippi, right? Yeah, I'm I'm up in the upland hardwoods of northern Mississippi, not far from Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. Yep. So we're we're in a little bit different region, so that that affects a lot of stuff. But really, the the biggest thing with mine is we're looking at the effect of doing going in and doing a four stand improvement, which is when you just go in and and some people refer to it as a timber stand improvement or TSI, and it's a little different, but basically the same thing as far as you're going in and treating trees and most people use hack and squirt for this basically where you take a hatchet and you hack a cut into the side of the tree and then squirt some herbicide into it we're doing our treatment a little different but it's basically the same thing we're treating trees and leaving them standing and just killing them with herbicide and the main question that we're looking at is if we go in and treat trees with herbicide and then burn how much improvement are we going to see in deer forage and turkey brooding cover availability? And so we went in and killed a bunch of trees. And then this past, that was over the winter. And now during the summer of 2018 was my first sampling season. So we looked at some different cover measurements, you know, how much, how much vegetation is there that's blocking, um, you know, how well a predator could see turkey poults. And we also collected some deer forage samples to look at how much food's out there. And we looked at the effect that the herbicide's having on the trees. And that's kind of the other thing I'm looking at is some intricacies with what herbicide you choose to use. And we're seeing some kind of interesting stuff with that um, thus far because there's a really commonly used herbicide, Garlon, that a lot of people use for these operations that does not kill hickory and hickory is a pretty commonly treated tree. So that's obviously going to be problematic. And so it's kind of interesting to see, to see that. And so we're looking at the use of a different herbicide mixture to possibly make up for the fact that you're not killing those hickory. Yeah. So basically for my research, we cut trees and burn them and, <laughs> and burn the woods, which all people always think is funny just because it's like, how is that? Uh, you know, there's tons of projects in wildlife that have collars on deer and stuff like that. And really, you know, sexy, flashy projects. And, and they're really cool yeah. and they get some good information, but there's also a fair amount of projects that, especially with stuff like deer, where we know what we know a lot of the things that they need that we can just look at the vegetation and see how it responds and look at that. So that's my project. And then I have a couple different side projects going on that we've kind of bounced around that the main one that, um, I guess that I'm actually doing and it's not just in the preliminary stages of possibly being done is we're working on putting together, we analyze some harvest data so just like every other state alabama's got harvest data from uh a long time and they also have data looking at the um they they went they went out and this is still going on and they basically tried to figure out when deer are breeding across the state and so they went out and shot a bunch of deer during the spring and summer and early summer and measured fetuses they were shooting does obviously and measured fetuses to figure out when they were bred. And they have this pretty cool like conception map that shows exactly, you know, when the average breeding dates were at, and, and a lot of the time there's a fair amount of variation even within counties. So that's kind of interesting, but basically what we're looking at is how does timing of the rut affect productivity? So how, you know, how many fetuses are we finding in deer that are bred in, November versus deer that are bred in February. Um, or not deer that are bred then, I shouldn't say it like that. I should say deer that are in a site that has an average breeding date of February versus November, for instance. So it, it's a pretty cool little publication that we're going to come out with. So 
that that's been kind of neat to work on. So yeah, there's always opportunities for other projects that are outside of your outside of your main research one, I guess is the long story short. So there's, there's, which is, which is nice because you can get a wide variety of experiences and opportunities to do different things. Because again, most of my stuff is based in, in the timber, but there's also opportunities to analyze data that's, um, or look at things that are not necessarily something that I would be looking at just for a master's project. So Anyway, that's the long and the short of what I'm, <laughs> what my project's looking at. Yeah. Uh, one other thing I, I think we failed to mention kind of about a master's program that's um, very important is our responsibilities. You know, I talked about producing a thesis, but usually within the first six to 12 months of beginning your program, you have to basically present your methods and, and your reason for research called your research proposal. You have to write that, get it accepted, and then you have to defend it um, in front of your department um, and your committee and basically defend why, you know, your research is relevant, why your methods um, are the best possible, and then get feedback and kind of amend your project uh, according to that. And then, you know, after your project is finished, um, you have to produce your thesis, so, you know, your written publications then you have to present your thesis uh, as a presentation in front of your department and usually it's a pretty big event you know people come all the professors from the department come and and then that's followed with a oral examination um basically just a knowledge-based examination to make sure that uh you know your committee your department will basically put their stamp of approval on you as a master's of science uh, graduate and then when you're clear of all that and your revisions and everything you're good you're good to go and that, that's the day that both mark and i are working toward with you know all of our our research and every day you kind of keep in mind that whatever you're doing uh in the field needs to be done well and it needs to be you know defendable and uh you also need to be learning about the system that you're working in and why you're doing what you're doing and why the vegetation is responding the way it is and, and, and as best you can become an expert in it because that's essential to graduating. It's more than just, oh, I'm out working and collecting this data and then here's what I got. But at the end, you have to show a working understanding, uh, an excellent understanding of everything, um, which is, yeah, it's kind of the, the, that's the capstone of it all is you have to be able to defend it. Yeah, and ba and basically the way I've always heard it, heard it said is you're supposed to be the the expert on your project not your professor not anybody else like you're supposed to know more about the specific thing that you're working on than anyone else and it just kind of happens it's not necessarily like that's not planned but it just happens because you're constantly thinking about it i mean you're spending two or three years of your life working on basically one thing yeah and um yeah, hey, I mean, it's just kind of cool. Let's talk about a little bit, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about working on it. Let's talk about our, what that, you know, what that's like for us as far as um, study seasons. I mean, obviously in the spring and fall, at least for you and I, our, our data collection season is primarily summer. Um, obviously, all this fall I've been collecting data and, and, and there is data that will have to be collected within the lab and, you know, helping other graduate students out around you know the year but as far as summer like what is what are your summers look like um as a graduate student and then what uh what kind of data are you collecting i mean you, you said measuring vegetation like give people an idea of, of <clears throat> exactly you know what you're looking at out there and what you know may through august look like for you obviously you're not just sitting in the office every day reading right papers. so during that time frame, I'm down at my study site basically all the time. Um, I have got a place down there to, to live, and I just stay down there and do my work. And, I mean, there's a there's a there's definitely some days that I end up being back in the office at Auburn just for one reason or another. But I'm basically outside the whole summer, which is kind of nice. It it kind of can be can be tough at times just because there are some pretty long days but 
it's a it's a good time and so basically what i'm collecting uh, just there's four main things i'm collecting so the first one is we're looking at what exactly what species composition of plants is making up these stands and how much of each of those is there so we're basically putting a tape measure out and then looking at okay this plant crossed the tape measure and is this big stuff like that and so with that you just have a you can basically figure out the percent of the stand that's like grass versus forbs which are just you know quote unquote weeds is what the way most people think about them broadleaf plants so so that's the first thing the second thing is we're looking at um brooding cover so with that we have this board it's called a nuds board and it's about it's two meters tall and it's divided into these different sections and basically we just look at it and we estimate the percent of each of those sections that is blocked that you can't see and what that tells us is okay like there's a lot of cover in these stands and so you can you can figure out how much cover there is um in each of the different heights so you know in this stand there's a lot of cover on the ground versus in another stand maybe there's a bunch of like sweet gums or something like that in the mid story and there's going to be a bunch of cover up top so that's the second thing the third thing is we're doing deer forage collections so we've got plots that are out there that we randomly selected and we go put a and by plots i don't mean food plots i mean little sampling locations <laughs> and uh <laughs> a lot of this terminology is probably foreign but um so I'm trying to describe everything as best as I could. And I've got this PVC pipe frame that I set down on the ground and we collect everything and put it in bags. And so the, well, we don't collect everything. We collect the plants that are eat, eaten by deer is basically what we're collecting. And so after we, after we collect it, we take it back to the lab and weigh it because that's how you, that's how you measure um, deer forage or any plant forage is it's it's just dried weight you know because you don't the water doesn't count towards anything as far as nutrition goes so we have that and then the last thing is a timber cruise so basically we go out and put in a circular area and we measure all the trees and we identify them and we look at whether they were treated or not and if they were treated with the herbicide did it kill it effectively or not? So yeah, that's that's basically it. Nice. And then so when you're measuring the trees, I'm guessing you also um but like in the burden stands, you're probably looking at whether there's fire damage, any like cat faces and damaged bowls and anything like that. Um, well we will, not yet, because we haven't burned them. But Okay, yeah. We will yeah, we're gonna look at some of that stuff after we burn so yeah like i say it we're looking at the effect of not only the effect of the uh, herbicide on the trees that we treated but also the effects of the herbicide and the burning on trees that we did not treat okay so sweet yeah that's basically what i'm collecting what what is what's your your basic data for most of this stuff look like so I haven't spent a complete summer uh, at Mississippi State. Obviously, I, I just began down here in July, so I don't have uh, I don't know exactly what the beginning of summer will be like for me. Um, a lot. So my my with my research, I have uh, courses in North Mississippi, and so I end up driving <laughs> from Starkville up to North Mississippi a lot. Um, so I'm become very familiar with that drive, but. Um, so up there we have, you know, several plots across a, a really large timber stand. We have several of our research plots set out across it. Um, and then they're divided up into seasonality of burns, so dormant season and, and growing season, summer burns, and then those that aren't burned. And then we also have some deer exclusion fences that I have to maintain. Um, so right now I have to have to change the batteries out on those every couple of weeks. They're solar powered, but obviously running a fence underneath an overstory hardwood forest is not the best uh, 
not the best place for an electric fence, um, which is what I'm running. Most people are probably familiar with them, like the hot zone fences that are marketed for hunting people, you know, the, the like buy it, you, you basically buy it in the store and it's ready to go and it's all the parts together. But we have larger fencing that obviously we can build for a lot cheaper just by buying the parts separately. And we have those, um, basically, you know, the, the three strand electric fence staggered, uh, tapes um and that's, so that's what i have that's what i'm running so i have five of those that i have to upkeep up there and keep the sticks off of and uh keep them you know live and keep them hot and try to keep the deer out of there uh so that's kind of one thing i have to do you know throughout the year uh, as far as data collection in there um the part that i'm 100 percent responsible for is doing vegetate or yeah vegetation transects so very similar to what you're doing um, just looking at, you know, what plants are crossing the transect at, uh, every so often, IDing those. We're just looking at forbs, grasses, and then any um, little seedlings that, might, you know, tree seedlings that might fall along that. And so, yeah, we look at the height of them, uh, of course, species, and then how much of that transect is covered with each of those. And then we'll do a bunch of transects in each block. Um, so that really has to, that really has to be done like once a year. Um, there's other graduate students that are working on these same treatments that I'm working on. So I help them with some of their data, looking more at the overstory hardwoods, um, the fire effect on those, measuring them, looking at growth, looking at canopy cover, uh, looking at we're, we're doing some work with the seedlings in there, uh, natural regenerating seedlings, oak seedlings, and um, those that aren't oaks. Also, we have some planted seedlings in there. We're looking at how those are, you know, affected by the fire and uh, deer herbivory. Um, so there's just a lot of data collection that's going on in these blocks. And then there's also some students that have some hydrology work going on in there. So looking at the water table, looking at um, how, you know, the different tree species are affecting uh, how the water basically hits the ground, flows across the ground, um, seeps into the ground all kinds of different stuff going in there. So there's a lot of students that have a lot of work going on in these bigger treatment blocks I'm working on. And then we end up helping each other out and pooling the data. Um, so we end up going back and forth up there quite a bit to collect data. Um, and that's kind of the bigger, the bigger project that I'm working on. And uh, right now, something I've been doing is with oak trees, I'm just getting going on this project, which is why I can't go home and hunt any of these weekends is basically I spend like last weekend, I didn't hunt one day. It was our fall break. And, and this is another thing with grad school, like you're not guaranteed time off necessarily. Um, our fall break was Thursday through Friday. So on Wednesday evening, when I got out of class, I went to my study site and worked a couple days and came back to school or came back to Starkville and then worked on processing data all weekend. Like Saturday, I didn't even step outside once. Um, it was the cold front. People were killing deer everywhere, but I was stuck inside processing data. So that's just kind of part of it, you know. Um, it, one other thing, you know, in the, in the big timber stands, I have all these trail cameras. We've got um, 60 trail cameras running. So the data, all the images that those cameras take has to be processed. So that's what I was working on last weekend. You know, it's just another thing that constantly has to be kept up with. I have to keep the cameras, you know, fueled with batteries and fresh cards and then keep analyzing the data, which to everyone out there, of course, trail cameras sound fun. And like, I love trail cameras for hunting, but it's a little different when you have to go through 20 or 30,000 photos and then write down the information for each one that has an animal in it and, you know, what species it is, a mouse or gray squirrel and what it's doing and how far it is from the camera and it takes forever um that's that's one thing that i have to keep up with constantly uh but so getting to my other project up there that i'm beginning um what i basically what it entails is i have all these oak trees and i'm looking at putting out acorns under them and trying to get a response from the deer trying to prove you know scientifically with the cameras that having more acorns brings in more deer, which might sound intuitive. Um, but there's a lot of things that we take for granted and you just, you know, look outside and you're like, Oh, well I saw a deer doing this. That's what they always do. Um, but it's, 
that information actually becomes useful when we can show scientifically with a lot of different plots, you know, over a bunch of different trees. I have 50 different trees. So we'll be able to show, no, it wasn't just this one tree that had this response by deer. It was all of them. And I'll be able to statistically show having more acorns brings in more deer. Um, we're going to be looking at acorn removal. So uh, I'm going to have a bunch of marked acorns out under these trees. And then at, you know, in spring, I'm going to have to go out and try to find those acorns that had the marks, and then we'll get a percentage of removal under these different trees. We're looking at how the deer affect um, the saplings underneath these trees or the seedlings, other the other uh, tree seedlings under these oak trees. So we're going to be looking at, you know, when deer come in to eat acorns, how is that affecting the plant community under these trees? And to do that, you know, just... To kind of give you an idea as far as you know what I'm doing right now is I've I've been setting up my plots up there, which takes a lot of time. I had to plant seedlings underneath all of my plot trees. I need to put cameras up up there. I had to measure all my plot trees and um, do acorn surveys in the crowns of all those trees. So I have data, you know, on all those trees before we started our treatments. And then right now, what I'm working on is collecting acorns to put out under those trees, which I estimate right now, I haven't done the number crunch exactly, but it's going to be around 60,000 acorns, give or take. I think it's going to be more like 65, probably, 1,000 acorns I have to pick up. So that was what I was working on yesterday, and uh, it's, it's it's different. So basically what I do to pick up acorns, because you're probably wondering what the heck, you know, that is, how do you do that? Um, I I end up doing some tree stalking is what I call it. Um, I get in uh I get in the truck and just ride around town and the university real slow, sometimes on the shoulder, sometimes if it's not busy in the road, and I just basically pull up the trees on the side of the road and look in their crowns, see if they're producing acorns and see if they're dropping. And uh yeah, that's what I've been doing. I was basically just stocking acorn trees for the last couple weekends. Uh yet yeah, last night I actually spent some time picking up some I don't know how many. I, I hadn't counted up exactly. I think I picked up thirty or 40,000 last night around some trees. We found some that were producing. They were dropping well. And uh, basically, you get... If anyone is familiar with like a pecan picker-upper, I don't know how else you would describe it. It's basically this rolling <laughs> drum of teeth. And you push it across the ground, and those and the, the nuts stick in the teeth. And then they come... They roll, you know, the roller goes around, and then at some point there's these little um, other big plastic teeth that knock the acorns out of the little pl little rubber teeth into a bin. So it's really hard to describe, but you basically push this thing around. It looks like an idiot everywhere, just like underneath these oak trees, pushing these little carts around. Uh, and it's really fun when you get underneath a good oak tree because you're just like going along and then you just hear, da -da 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 -da, and the acorns are flying into the bin, and you're like, oh yeah, let's go pick up acorns. Um, <laughs> you get really excited because you spend all this time looking for oak trees that are dropping, and it can be frustrating to find them. But that's kind of so that's that's how i'm collecting them and then you know as far as like i need to know how many acorns i'm putting out underneath the trees obviously i'm not going to count sixty thousand acorns individually so i'm determining on an average that are in a gallon it looks like i'm gonna have to pick up around 130 gallons of acorns um for the project so that that's kind of that's what i'm doing you know there on that that's a few <laughs> yeah it's a few it it's actually pretty fun when you get underneath a good oak tree like it's it's pretty fun. I enjoy it, but it's frustrating like I spend a lot of time riding around trying to find these trees i just scouting acorns it's really no different than hunting like I go around with binoculars in the truck. I probably look like a, a class eight creep really because <laughs> I'm like driving through shopping centers, making loops all around shopping centers and like pull out the the binoculars and looking around in these trees looking for you know nuts falling and I don't know. It's uh it's something different for sure. <laughs> yeah, I I couldn't imagine that. I'm certainly glad that I do not have to pick up acorns. But again, I mean sometimes you gotta be creative with your project and the way you design things and I don't know. That's one of the fun things is while obviously you're working with someone else that has the mm -hmm 
end of the day, yes or no on anything, any decisions you make, you know, your advisor, it's still kind of nice because you have a lot of flexibility in making different day-to-day decisions and, you know, with, I don't know, are you going to have a technician? Uh, no, there's really not funding for it. Um, okay. What we end up doing, like some of the students in our lab have technicians. We have one lab technician who helps out. Um, just kind of between all the students. And so I end up using her. She ends up helping me a lot. Um, but then okay. what I, I end up, you know, working a lot. I have, um, sometimes people will volunteer to help, which is awesome. I really appreciate it when uh, people are willing to help. So I get that. And then sometimes, you know, other students will come with me and help and, and vice versa. I'll go and help them. So we end up kind of helping each other out, you know, as much as possible and try to limit, um, hiring out as much as we can just to save money yeah i was gonna say because that's that's one of the things that's kind of cool is i've had two technicians so far and with both those instances i was able to make the hire and make the decision and they both did great work so that that's kind of a rewarding thing um being able to do hiring for for stuff but yeah Yeah. i mean it's just all in all at the end of the day um it's pretty it's pretty cool. It's a it's it's a different it's a different field. I guess that's something we should we should mention is, you know, what what's any advice or recommendations that you would give to somebody that was looking at possibly going to grad school in wildlife? Yeah, I so you know early on and and this is why I really wanted us to talk about this because um, I think it'll be beneficial to anyone listening. You know, early on, it, it's hard to figure out what grad school is eventually. You know, like what it exactly it is like what do you do um and hopefully we've covered that pretty well today and hopefully people aren't more confused but you know grad school is so different than undergrad like like we said you don't spend a lot of time in classes basically to come to grad school you need to be able to function on your own you need to be able to take responsibility and get things done and just like you said a second ago you know our advisors have a lot they put a lot of um you know, they put a lot of responsibility on us, but they obviously trust us a lot because they give us a lot of things to do. And uh, I have a great advisor that, you know, gives me work to do. And then he's not, you know, asking me every day whether I did it. I just get stuff done. And then I report to him if I need a, you know, if I have a problem or something. And I really appreciate that because I, I work really well like that. Like I love to have, like you're saying, the responsibility, knowing what I need to do and taking ownership of my project and, and getting things done. Like, that motivates me more than anything is just knowing that it's mine and like running with it. And I think, you know, absolutely like to be, to be a grad student, it's really important that you have that, you know, desire to, to produce something on your own, you know, um, a a piece of, of research that's beneficial. Like I, I want my research to be used by other people. I want it to influence how people manage Oak Forest. I want it to, you know, benefit the future of our, of the forest in America. Um, and, and and so I, I do truly believe what I'm doing is important and will influence future management decisions. So that's kind of what motivates me. But I guess I'm on, I, I went on a rant there or a tangent, but like it, being a, in, you know, whether you're an undergrad or you're in high school or maybe, you know, you graduated in a whole different field, like you can still get into graduate school. The, the, the biggest thing is you need to, number one, I think is sh- showing that you're interested and showing on paper, which is kind of tough, but really what it comes down to is you need to be able to prove through your resume or your CV that you're serious. Um, if you're an undergrad, you, you should be volunteering. You should be working. Like, I don't know how many people in undergrad I know that have spent summers just at home goofing off or working at McDonald's or whatever, and you're not accomplishing anything. I know, you know, in undergrad, I spent you know, a month working on a project with another graduate student. I volunteered with Fish and Wildlife Service. I, um, I worked last summer up, uh, you know, uh, up in Indiana on a on a wildlife um, internship, working with an extension specialist up there, and basically showing through my experience what I'm interested in, which is habitat management. But more than that, I showed that I was willing to, you know, leave. Even if it was just for summer, you know, leave North Carolina, move somewhere temporarily, work hard, put in time, and then that also generated references. So, you know, the wildlife field, really any field, I'm sure, but especially the wildlife field, it's all about who you know, which it sounds bad, but I don't don't claim to know a lot of people in the field. 
But then when you go to a conference uh, like Southeast Deer Study Group or, or any of these conferences, you start to realize how many people there you know or people that you might not necessarily know, but they're you know best buddies with the guy you worked for last summer um, or people that you know that you work for somebody and they went to under they did you know graduate school under one professor and and that's the professor you would like to work for that kind of thing like you can't anticipate that and so being an undergrad besides getting good grades and being serious about school you really have to get out and work you can't just say oh i want to go to grad school and then go and work at you know mcdonald's every every summer because you're not showing that you're ready to take that step and actually work in the field you have to prove that you can go out, work in, you know, 95 degree heat every day and, you know, whatever the conditions are that might be a little bit adverse. And then you need to have somebody that can say, yeah, he came, he worked all summer, he worked hard and be able to tell your future advisor um, the same deal. Uh, what would you add to that, Mark? I think that's basically the same thing. It's just like in any field and i think this is something people underestimate but it's just like in any field you you get back what you put in and while yeah we're we're doing fun stuff day in and day out it is hard work and so just having the ability to prove yourself that you're interested in stuff i I think that's the biggest thing is just being passionate though um i think that is probably has the biggest influence on i mean certainly proving what we're interested in through our experiences helps and that obviously gets you an interview but i think the biggest thing to actually getting hired is not your grades or i mean all these things matter like your grades matter your test scores matter your uh your experience matters but the thing that matters way more than any of that is just having the passion for what you want to do and knowing you know i want to do this exact project for these reasons and this is why i'm interested in it and and not just being like, well, I, I just want to go to grad school. I don't really know what I want to do. I mean, if you're passionate about deer, then be passionate about deer. Don't don't make any uh, you know don't make any qualms about it, and or, or you know think that oh well, uh, I should try to. And there certainly is benefits to having diverse experiences, and so I don't mean to discourage having diverse experiences, but at the same time, like if you're interested in deer then take jobs that are working on deer, you know, don't, don't try to just do a bunch of different stuff just because, I mean, yes, certainly have diversity, but at the same time, I think having some level of specialization is, is important too. Yeah. You know, particularly with a, with, with a species like deer, because, you know, the students that are passionate about deer work, are typically able to get jobs like there's, I mean, or get grad positions. I mean, and I don't, I don't mean just deer there's, I mean that probably for any species, but deer one in particular, you know, people oftentimes, and I've been told like, Oh, you probably shouldn't focus on that because it's such a competitive thing because everybody wants to work with deer. But I mean, when you get down to it, it's not, I mean, uh, in some ways it's almost, it's like, yeah, it's competitive, but there's also a lot of opportunities. And that's part of the reason why there's a lot of people that are interested in doing it. So I I just think, you know, pick what you want to do. And I mean, there's, again, there's nothing wrong with, with changing what you're, you want to focus on Uh, for both of us. It was habitat management, which makes us very flexible. And it's one of the great things about it is it's hard work because you're looking at plants. You're not doing some, you know, super cool. Well, I, I think it's cool, but you're not doing what a lot of people would term as like this super cool thing. And, so that's that's helpful because it turns away a lot of people because it's like oh you're not going out there and actually ever handling animals which is what a lot of people want to do is catch animals and put transmitters on them and follow them around and again that's valuable not at all hating on that but if you're willing to look into like working with habitat management for instance you have a lot of flexibility and can work with any species and a lot of people are going to shy away from those positions just because it's not as cool or sexy or whatever as a as a collar project yes <laughs> basically exactly. is what you're the, Again, th- I, those projects are it. really competitive yeah i love it and i would not trade what i'm doing for anything but at the same time 
it does benefit me and I think it benefit has benefited you to be interested in something that's there are the amount of opportunities that there is with habitat management research. And I would say one thing too, like, you know, don't get discouraged if you haven't been able to find, you know, a job working with deer, like my, you know, up until last summer, all I had worked with, I had worked with Bachman sparrows and I had banded uh, ducks for a month. You know, I worked with sparrows for a month, banded ducks for a month. Um, then last summer I, uh, my work was all, you know, I was doing habitat um, transects and I was collecting forage biomass and doing stuff like that and working with extension and getting that, what you know the habitat um experience but i had also showed that i was interested in habitat work and, and interested with deer like i interned with um qdma uh, which was a great experience i know mark you did that too um i you know i spent time writing for qdma i obviously i'm a really serious hunter um which has come up with pretty much all the interviews i've had is that it's not just a job I want. It's because I, I love these animals that I want to work with them. And I want to do something that benefits them. And then, you know, pair that with um, experience that you have. And like Mark's saying is, you know, with the habitat thing is like, if you can pick up something that you're interested in and be the, be the best, you know, out there at it. Obviously, I'm not the best, you know, uh, habitat manager out there. But um, as far as, you know, undergrads at least, um, that I know I was probably the, the most uh, crazy about it, uh, second to Mark. Like, I mean, we we're both like very serious about it and, and learning our plants, you know, learning different uh, grasses and forbs just on our own, just because that's what interested us. And, you know, both you and I have done a lot of work on our personal properties. And I know that's on my resume and something I've talked about is that I, I do prescribe fire on my properties because I love it. And, um, because I want to improve the properties for deer. And so it was more than just, oh, I have work experience. It's that this is what I do, you know, throughout the year. Uh, even though I'm not getting paid for it, I'm still learning. Um, d taking deer steward courses for Q with QDMA, like that's something that's on my resume um, and something, you know, I'm uh, proud to have taken part in. And it's all really great experience. And it, and, and I guess so what I'm saying is don't let jobs limit you. If there's nothing else, like take any job in the wild, I feel like a summer job just to get experience, to get to know people. Um, and who knows, you may discover something that you're really passionate about that you, you would have never predicted before. But it, it's important, more than anything, it's important to get out and actually work and not just, you know, sit there and, and plant and, and think, oh, in the future, I'll start working in the wild. I feel like you need to get out there now. And, uh, and one other thing, Mark, I, I'm curious your thoughts on this too, but for anyone out there that thinks they may want to, you know, work in the wild, wildlife field, um, but they maybe haven't gone to college yet, um, maybe they got a degree in chemistry or anything, you know, I, I, I do believe this and I've seen it many times that there's places, even if you're interested in graduate school, you can get into graduate school without having an undergrad in wildlife science like you and I do. It's definitely you know, true. I, yeah, I, I think the biggest thing there in that case is that you should try to get experience in the field for one to make sure it's something you actually want to do. Um, it's hard work and you may discover it's not for you or you may discover this is what you want to do the rest of your life. So, you know, try to get experience. And then if you do get some references and start applying to graduate schools um, and and see where it can take you, uh, I think. That's something we should look at next. Uh, I probably last thing is applying for graduate school. Why don't you Why don't you take that one away, Mark? Yeah. So basically, if you're interested in grad school, um, you don't go the at least if you want to go the thesis route, which is definitely definitely the better route to go um, for wildlife. If you want to go uh, the thesis route, you don't just start applying to the school itself. What you're gonna want to do is go on. Texas A&M job board, which is a wildlife job board that has pretty much everybody posts all their jobs there and they're going to have jobs listed and just start applying for them. And they're, you know, it'll be grad positions. And one of the things I'll say about that too, that's an important point is even if you can't necessarily make whatever start date apply, you should still apply because neither Mariah or I are actually working on the grad position that we originally applied for. 
And so it's, that's, that's an important thing, you know, you don't necessarily have to, I mean, we're, we're working for the same person and we're doing similar research. Well, you're doing similar research. I'm actually not. Um, but it's important to just get out there and start applying for stuff. And even if you maybe are not going to be graduated for a couple months or whatever the case is, just go ahead and apply for it and see. And then the other thing is to look, look up professors and that have interests that kind of line up with yours and contact them directly and just, you know, see if they've got any positions coming up. And, um, that goes a long way. Just, you know, a phone call or email just to say, Hey, like, do you have any, any positions coming up that, these are my interests and I just wanted to kind of check and see because sometimes positions can be um, kind of created for a student or kind of around a student. If there's a student that a professor wants to work with, then they'll kind of create a job that works around that. And that kind of saves them from having to advertise. So yeah, just get out and apply. And like I say, even if it's not the, even if the timing isn't right or something isn't a hundred percent right about the position, still apply for it because you never know. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that's the, that's about mm-hmm. it. I mean, I don't, unless there's anything you, you think you would say in addition to that. No, I like what you said there. Um, for my position, I applied, it was the same project but I applied with a different professor and I'm working on the same project for a different professor and actually ended up like you're saying the position I applied for sounded great. It wasn't exactly what I had envisioned myself doing, but it sounded like a good position. So I applied for it and then ended up getting referred to Dr. Lashley, who I work for now. And this position was made for me. And I really believe it's where I'm meant to be. Um, and so, you know, I'm really thankful for that. Of course, I love the position. I uh, I don't regret it at all. I love every day of it. Like you said, some days are, are kind of rough. Some days might be a little frustrating. There's about every day is a really long day, and the week just kind of every week drags into the next, and you have stuff to do. But I, for one, love to stay busy, and I'm working with something I love. Like I just every day I'm out working, I, I try to at least. I just take a breath of fresh air, appreciate that I'm – essentially getting paid and and getting an education. I'm out in the woods measuring oaks or picking up acorns or putting out acorns or, you know, checking trail cameras. Like that's incredible. And I'm, you know, I'm excited about the future of of what I hope to do as a career once I get out of graduate school. I know you are too. And uh, I think if anyone's out there that is interested in graduate school, they should totally consider it, you know, and, uh, if if you have any questions, um, send them our way. I would be happy to help anyone out that has questions about graduate school. Uh, so, yeah, send them, you know, post a comment, um, anything like that. If you have a question, definitely send it our way. I would love to help, especially if it's in the wildlife field with graduate school. Hopefully we could give, you know, some advice or answer questions and help help you understand it better. Um, besides that, that's about all I've got on it. Yeah, same here. Um, I think that it's a good field to be in, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. So, yeah, definitely hit us up if you have any questions about it. And I hope this has been helpful and uh, maybe giving you some insight, even if you're just kind of curious about what exactly we do. Yeah, well, I know what I'm about to do, and that's going to be drive over to a, new, to a piece of public ground and climb up in a black willow the salix nigra and i hope to shoot a deer out of it and get another species on you mark (laughs) there you go i hope you do it (laughs) (laughs) i hope i at least see a deer tonight because i haven't the last couple times i've gone so uh wish me luck there because i'm gonna need it (laughs) yeah uh good luck and send me a picture of a bloody arrow all right Sounds good. I'm going to try to do it. Um, We appreciate everybody listening. We hope this has been a help to you. I know I would have loved to know some of these things, you know, early in undergrad, preparing for graduate school. If you have any questions, definitely you can um, post a comment on our Facebook page, message us on Facebook, comment on this post on Facebook or Instagram. 
Uh, also, for each one of these podcast episodes, if you go to our website, huntingtheland.com, since this is episode 16, go to huntingtheland.com slash podcast 16, and that will be the blog post for this uh, this podcast. And I'll have all the links. You know, For every podcast, there's usually links to a product that we're talking about or an article or something. All those links will be found there, so that's usually a really good place to start. If you have questions, you can post them there. You can post comments there, and we will answer them the best we can and try to be as helpful as possible um, and and give you uh, some information there. So with that, we are going to jump off here. I think we've talked enough. Uh, We appreciate you being with us. We hope that you enjoy the podcast, and we would love it if you would give us a rating and review on iTunes. That would be a big help for us. And we would really greatly appreciate it. So with that, we will talk to you all next week. Thank you for listening.